Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Josiah DeMille of Millet Knives. Millet is the premier high-end specialty knife OEM in the United States. They have produced prestige production knives for the likes of TJ Schwarz, Joe Caswell, Serge Panchenko, Gavco Knives, G&G Hawk, and the list goes on and on. They are known for their exceptional engineering and build quality and have milled out an increasingly critical niche in the U.S. knife industry. With the ever-growing popularity and accessibility of Chinese OEMs, Many of us in the knife community hope other U.S. knife companies will pick up the mantle and make more of their knives that we love right here at home. And, um, well, I look forward to talking about this and more with Josiah. Uh, but first, you ever find yourself mowing the lawn, washing the dishes, uh, driving to work? Well, I do. As a matter of fact, this past weekend, I had a lot of catching up to do on the lawn. And what do I do then? I pop in headphones. And what do I listen to? Do I listen to music? No. Do I listen to sports? No. Politics? I used to, but I burned out on that. But I listen to podcasts. The point is, I listen to podcasts. And you can do that very same thing with the Knife Junkie podcast. You don't have time to sit around and watch an hour-long YouTube video or a video on uh, one of our other streaming services, well, you can just catch us right here on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeart, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, Pandora, all of these places where you get the other audio podcasts you love and enjoy, uh, you can find The Knife Junkie right there. Catch up on all of our old episodes and catch each new episode just by subscribing at any one of those services. And you'll hear me in your ear when you mow the lawn or do the dishes. How's that sound? Sound good? All right, let's get into it. The GetUpside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. GetUpside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Josiah, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So uh, you came onto my radar, or Millet Knives came onto my radar eh, three or four years ago, I'd say. And uh, I was shocked that someone in the United States was doing what you were doing, because at that point, I hadn't, I had just hadn't heard of any companies making OEM, you know, high, high-end OEM knives right here in the States. Uh, how, how did you get started with millet? Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of an interesting story. Um, so it's actually a father son business, um, my father and myself. Um, so years ago, we were we were working together um, in a shop, and you know it, it always been kind of our our lifelong dream to be able to start a shop together. You know, we we kind of share a passion in manufacturing and and just generally making stuff, and you know doing kind of coming up with the, the concept and, and the ideas and then be able to make make it better than what we had seen out there. And so uh, the opportunity arose for us to start uh, a machine shop. And, you know, it's always, you know, it's always tough starting a new business. You know, how do you get funding? How do you build the infrastructure? How do you get things rolling? And so we actually just started out as a small job shop, you know, just looking for any contract manufacturing work. We, we brought a small mill, a uh, milling machine into the garage. Um, we actually cut a hole in the ceiling so the top of the machine could fit up into the rafters. Um, you know, we, we squeezed a small drill press in there and we had a couple of the uh, little garage air compressors in there, you know, the ones that just sit there and rattle your brains out as they run. And, you know, we, <laughs> we were burning through those, you know, every couple of weeks and so we'd have two or three on rotation. When one would burn up, we'd bring in the other one and plug it in and rebuild the one that burned out. And so we it could go back into the lineup for rotation and um, just kind of cruise around looking for work, looking for, you know, new ideas and new customers. And um, we did that for about eight months. And then we moved into uh, a larger facility. It was about 2000 square feet. And 
from there, we, we were able to start finding more and more work. You know, there was at that time, there was just a lot of interest in uh, good machine shops, you know, and, and somebody who would take the time to pay attention and, and do and do a good job rather than just making something and throwing it out the door and, um, you know, telling the customer, you know, there you go, that's it. You know, somebody that would take the time to, to make sure it's right, you know, and do the little things, you know, deburr them, clean them up, um, just stuff like that. And, and so we were making hot rod parts. We were making parts for machinery. We were making parts for um, an engineering company, you know, whatever little thing they had that they in their in their projects. Um, and then, you know, eventually we had some people stop by and uh, ask us if we could make knives, you know, and we're like, well, yeah, actually, we do know how to make knives. And um, so we worked on that project and um, help that customer and actually they they have a company now and they're still selling those knives and uh you know they've expanded a little bit and done some other things but uh every once in a while we get an order in for the for those original knives and um yeah and then it just kind of escalated from there you know once one person started sending out the work they found somebody they could make knives and um you know the word spread and other people came to us and you know we actually uh we actually kind of hunted out uh gavin hawk uh, we we knew them and so we kind of picked their brain a little bit like hey you know if you got anything you need us to help you with you know we could we're here and let us know and at the time they kind of just okay yeah sure whatever and then sure enough you know they had the idea like hey you know these guys could probably help us out and so um one of the one of the first things we did is we asked them if we could license the little uh, the little pony knife and there's a little bit of history there with with my dad and grant where uh, my dad had helped grant with some cad files um, to help them on on another project and grant had given my dad a uh, a custom pony knife uh, which is a beautiful knife it was jeweled on the side had uh is that the little fixed blade knife it is it is yeah. it's a little fixed blade it's it's kind of modeled after a little derringer so it's got a, a big finger groove in it um just fits a little three finger knife um, you know, and those customs that Grant did back then, he actually took the horse hoof himself and stabilized them and processed them to fit on those knives. And they're beautiful little knives. And so anyways, my dad had always fallen in love with that. And he always thought, man, we should, we should take that into a production knife because it's such a cool little knife. But it's like, I really don't want to take my custom, my beautiful custom little brass and horse hoof knife that's all jeweled and polished on the side out into the woods and start scratching it up, you know? And so... Uh, we approached them like, "Hey, do you mind if we do this?" And they're like, "Yeah, sure." So we signed a we signed a license agreement, and we made a couple batches of them. You know, we we didn't push them real hard or take them that far, but it was a real cool um, start into that, and, and got us kind of rolling into our own stuff. And um, yeah, you know, and we eventually the company was started out just using our last name, uh, Demille Works, mm -hmm. and then when we started, when we eventually started moving more into knives. Uh, we came up with the name Millet, uh, which is kind of a play on a couple different words. You know, we, uh, uh, coming from a mean, machine shop background and machining, we didn't want to do the handwork. We didn't want to do the hand forging. We didn't want to be hammering away. We didn't want to be standing at the grinder all day, you know, and and uh, that's great for the guys that want to do that. But that, let's face it, that's hard work, you know, and those guys, they, they put their, their time in and definitely the sweat. And so we we're like, man, that's not for us. But how do we how do we make this happen on a mill you know how do we turn this into kind of a a low to mid-level production high quality bring in the 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 tolerance and the high-tech machining aspect to it and um yeah and so then you know more and more customers came in uh gavin referred us to serge panchenko and and both of those guys even today have just been fantastic customers and i love working with those guys and they're great guys and they support us and they you know they've they've hung with us and um you know they definitely throw out their challenges for sure you know mm -hmm. but uh it's been great I, and we love dealing with them i would uh, imagine both of those guys in particular uh the, the hawks and serge uh, panchenko a lot of their um, designs are somewhat complicated or complex looking <laughs> especially to reproduce you know, on any sort of scale. I mean, that's that's kind of, uh, uh, yeah, you were, you were saying millet, uh, how the name came about. It's not only hard work to be hitting, you know, using the hammer and standing at the grinder all day, but if you want to make a go at it and produce 
um, you know, have a high fidelity reproduction of something over and over, uh, it seems like your recipe is the way to go. Yeah, and you know, we come we come from the background of making some knives, and uh, for the longest time, that was a big debate. You know, is is using CNC machi machining for making knives is that cheating? You know, is that really <laughs> the the proper way to make knives? You know, and I think there's probably still some debate in there between the guild and the either, you know the custom forge guys. But the more I watch the knife industry grow, the more and more I see the small custom guys, sooner or later, they end up with a CNC in the garage. Yeah, the question is, does it result in a knife? Right, right. And if it does, then... then it, so I didn't know that uh, that Millet was a father-son uh, operation. That immediately uh, makes me like you more. <laughs> it's like one of those things that keeps coming up on this show. Uh, uh, there are so many family knife businesses, mm -hmm. and uh, I love that. To me, that's part of, you know, um, for me, talking to knife makers who have made a go at it and can make a living making knives, uh, whether it's as a manufacturer or a small company or as a single knife maker, to me, that is, uh, you know, achieving the American dream. But you do that with your family, and yeah. that's, you know, that's everything. Absolutely, you know, and my father doesn't come out much. He's he he likes just hanging in the back and running machines and doing his thing, and and, and that's totally fine, you know. But um, we've always gone along really well. We work well together. Um, you know, people give us a hard time all the time that uh, we all but finish each other's sentences, and <laughs> you know, all we'll, one of us will be sitting in the room talking to somebody about an idea, and another one one of us will enter the room like, hey, I just had a great idea. What if we do this? And it, it'll almost be word for word <laughs> what the other one of us had just said. And, you know, and then the, the staff that's looking at us, they just look at us and shake their head like, wow, you know, it's like you just heard each other and we're on the same wavelength. And so that's kind of an inside joke all the time. And, uh, you know, and then we we obviously banter back and forth occasionally and we get the occasional, you know, joke of, you know, this is why we don't work with family to kind of <laughs> But it's well, a good fun, you know, and it's great. Well, if you're, you know, you, you've just described how you're very similar and you're kind of on the same wavelength. Uh, what are your complementary um, uh, uh, qualities? How do you differ and, and how does that, what kind of strength does that bring to the operation? Um, yeah, so so my dad's name's Merlin. Um, he's been a journey journeyman machinist for whew, 39 years now. So, I mean, he knows CNC's inside and out. Um, he's really good at figuring out how to make stuff work, you know, and, and that's, that's always a, a challenge in the knife industry, especially as we work with a lot of these designers, because a lot of them approach this with, with an idea, whether it's in sketch, whether it's in CAD or whether it's still just in their head, you know, and, and designers um, are very interesting to work with because you know they have an idea and they're they're trying to figure out how to execute it and bring it to life and sometimes it the idea is out there you know it's like how, how do you make this work you know and um we're actually a pretty small shop i don't think people realize just how small we are you know and so we're pretty limited on equipment and sometimes we just kind of have to use what we got to make it work and uh you know that's something that i've always appreciated is guys who can take uh their limitations and really really make stuff happen and, and really show what they can do uh, with those limitations. And so, you know, we've, we've had our challenges. Uh, and I think you said it right with the, the challenge of so many knives coming in from China and trying to be an American manufacturer and, and take those complexities uh, with our, our limitations and our challenges and, and bring them to life and make them to a knife that the customer's happy with, you know, and and fortunately, we've had a lot of success. You know, we've had some deals that unfortunately just didn't work out. You know, we, we did what we could. And um, sometimes it's, you know, whether it's our fault or not, it, unfortunately, sometimes they don't work out. But, you know, on every job, we try to do the best we can and, and put put everything we can into it to, to make the project successful. And, you know, and generally those that hang in with us and, and help us figure it out and are the, are the really good customers that um, they're the ones that have the successful the successful launch of a knife and, and product, you know, and people are generally excited about it and something that we're definitely proud of as well. Uh, you had at have, I should say, the Perpetua, uh, which is a gorgeous EDC uh, knife. I, I don't have one. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I have 
planned on changing that for quite a while at this point. But uh, interesting thing about the Perpetua is, um, well, it's a TJ Schwartz design. It's a millet uh, production, um, but it's coming through Drop, the company Drop, right? Yeah. So there are three entities involved in the creation of the Perpetua. How does that work? How, how does that, I mean, how does that work? So in the contract uh, manufacturing realm, there's a couple of ways we go about it. And we actually do a lot of product for customers that they kind of wish to not be disclosed. You know, um, mm -hmm. I'm working on a couple of knives that the customer's like, nah, I'd rather not people not know you're involved. They just want the ability to have a good quality product and say that it's US made, which is fine by us. Mm -hmm. um, the situation with the drop, uh, originally they approached us and said, Hey, you know, we do so many imported knives. We really want to have a line of American made. And so we said, okay, well, we get it, but they didn't really have designers or engineers or anybody on staff to help them facilitate that. Because, uh, as far as I understand the way this, uh, the Chinese companies work is you have a, a design or an idea and you can send it to them. And with the order, of, of the product, they put all their in the in-house staff, engineers, uh, designers, whatever, to kind of dial everything in and then it goes into production. And so uh, at that time we had done several projects with TJ Schwartz and, you know, we just love working with TJ to death. He's such a great guy, you know, um, we, we referred them to him said, Hey, get with TJ, you know, he'll help you iron out what, what you have in your head as far as the design. Uh, we'll get into CAD and then when you guys kind of got everything dialed in and, and, and where you're happy, then send it over to us. We'll look at it. We'll do a quote on the, on the job and then we'll get it made for you and deliver it. And so, um, it was really kind of drops deal and we weren't really sure if we were even going to be brought, uh, into it name wise. Um, but I guess at some point uh, they decided through their marketing research or whatever that they, they wanted to bring our names into it because it would definitely give credibility to the project. Yeah. And, you know, it, there, there was some frustrations in that job. You know, I think that uh, to meet certain price points, there were certain decisions made on materials and things. And, um, you know, the customers that have that, they know there was a, there was an issue with the clip. Uh, we made the clip out of a out of a cheaper stainless instead of doing it properly out of some uh, hardenable steel or at, just directly out of titanium, mm -hmm. and so they just they just bent and um, out of shape, and so the customer was pretty frustrated. To to help with that, we actually just we went ahead and made a titanium version and said, hey, you know, if you guys have an issue, like reach out to us. Don't even bother going through drop, and then we'll get you hooked up with a titanium clip. No problems. You know, cool. You're good to go, and so after there were so many complaints after the first batch that we had delivered because they had put in a, a pretty substantial size order. And so we were delivering in certain increments. And uh, so that first batch, they had received uh, quite a few complaints. And so we kind of worked our way through those. And then they approached and said, Hey, you know, even if it take costs a little bit more money, we're going to have to fix these issues. And we said, well, we definitely agree. You know, we should really shouldn't have taken that shortcut to begin with. And so we made a couple of the tweaks and the guys that are buying those, you know, they know that is the, uh, the rev two. And, uh, we had the improved, uh, I believe it was the, the pivot and the pocket clip and even the liners, we completely changed the material on the liners, the pocket clip. We did a nicer, uh, machined pivot. And so we really felt like we brought it up and made it a, a much, much nicer knife. And so, yeah. Um, you know, we, we delivered the second batch and then they ended up uh, drop, decided to go ahead and uh, discontinue the rest of the order. And that's just kind of where they left it. And so um, we just it was supposed to be a, a much bigger run and have more out there, more available. And then they just decided to, to not uh, continue. And now it runs into a, a kind of a tricky situation where it's their design that they commissioned TJ to help design and they commissioned right. the manufacture. So we don't really have any leeway to take it and make more and provide them, which is unfortunate because it, it had a lot of potential. We had some cool ideas that we could have thrown at it, but sometimes that's just the way it happens. Yeah. And that, that also means that uh, those of us like 
like myself who didn't strike while the iron was hot. Now I have to pay double on the secondary right. market when I find it. Right. But, uh, you know, uh, it, it struck me um, funny when you said some people don't like, you know, your name mentioned. And, and I, 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 I guess I get that. But on, on the other hand, um, I have this Newfoundland knife Ranger a yeah. knife you guys made. And um, this comes from a new maker, a relatively new maker. And uh, he reached out to me. Hey, do you want to check this out? I'm like, sure, of course, I'll check out any knife. And he said, oh, by the way, uh, it was made by Millet in the U.S. And I was like, send it over. You know, like that was, <laughs> I mean, that, that really, um, that really sealed the deal for me. You know, I, I would have looked at it anyway, but when he right. when he mentioned your name, I was like, okay, so now I know that if I like the design and it actually feels good in my hand the way I the way it seems like it will just from looking at it, it's going right. to be a great knife because the quality and the engineering and all that stuff, it, it's a foregone conclusion. And and I would imagine for new companies, new outfits to use the name Millet would be a real feather in your cap, not only for that reason, but also everyone knows that you're a USA company. Right. You know, and, and some of the more, uh, the, especially the newer companies, that's, that's definitely on their radar and they understand that. And that's, and that was our goal was to, to build a brand that people could recognize and customers like Newfoundland knives, when, if they contract us to make it, you know, they could use our name and say, Hey, you know, I had Millet make this. So as far as the manufacturing is concerned, you know, you know, you're going to get a good quality knife. You're going to be able to get service if there's ever any issues, because we're right here domestically. We can we can help you out with any issues, um, you know, and, and it, it adds that value to the product. And, and that's you know, and that's our goal. And so we we love it when the new customers uh, do promote us. And but, you know, in the, in the business world, sometimes it's about your brand, you know, and you're trying to build brand and sure. yeah. sometimes you don't really want to disclose somebody else's brand, especially if there's a chance that it could detract from yours. And so there's always this tug of war in the business world. You know, how do I how do I use my brand? How do I expose it? How do I present it to the customer base? You know, how how do I want this to 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 work? And, you know, and there's there's knife companies that we just make parts for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we we just make a bunch of them and send them to them and they assemble it and finish it and do whatever. And yeah, there's a, there's a hawk pony knife. <laughs> yeah. That is such a cool, that's such a cool, you call that the slim line. Is that so yeah, there's two versions. So the one you see on right now, that is the, the full contoured handle, Coca Bowl okay. handle, Cerakote finish, we call the pony. And then we did a, a flat handle with a Kydex sheath that we call the slim line. And we found that there there's, there was two different customers that were interested in that knife. There was more of the traditional carry guys, you know, the guys that liked the leather sheath, they liked um, the full contoured handle that fit in your hand. And then there was what I would consider the, the younger generation that's all about the, the high tech, um, how slim and sleek it is. You know, mm -hmm. they like the, the high tech material of the, of the composite, you know, the, the Kydex. And I count myself in that crowd because I carried a slim line, you know, and it was beautiful because I could tuck it in the back belt and right. carry it behind me. And, you know, it was great. So, yeah, I would I would go for the slim line because I like well, I carry fixed blades pretty much every day mm -hmm. and I like them. Uh, you know, I like them discreetly carried. I mean, right. legally, I could walk around with it on my belt, but I also know where I live. People would freak out. So right. um, just having it, having the, the option to be discreet. For is sure. Always, yeah. Sometimes what people don't know is doesn't hurt them. It's just fine. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. They also don't know it's legal to carry it on your belt, you know, so they would freak right. at that too. So, right. Well, we are in Idaho, so, you know, we, we get away with probably a little more than other places. Right. Idaho, such a knife state. Oh yeah. Uh, have you guys have, have, have you and your father or you and, or your father always been uh, knife guys or, or was this more something that you came to when you were trying to find your niche uh, as a machine shop? So we actually, we actually worked for Chris Reeve knives. Um, okay. and that was the shop we worked together in. And, uh, my father started working for them back in the late nineties. Uh, one of their early machinists when they were still pretty small. And of course I was a young kid, you know, knives are cool. Uh, he's in a full shop making stuff. And so I got to know Chris pretty well and uh, he would hire me on, uh, 
spring break, uh, Chris, uh, summer vacations while I was in high school. Oh, cool. You know, I'd come in and I'd do whatever I could, just grunt labor kind of stuff. And uh, you know, that's where I that's where I really learned a lot. And then I I left for several years, did my schooling, uh, graduated, and then got hired back on as a production manager. And my my dad was working there still uh, as one of their machinists. And so we kind of, we worked there for oh I guess it was around just shy of another four years. And at that time we were like okay well, you know we we decided it was time to do our thing. And so there we are today. And and I think that's kind of what helped us get going into the knife is we kind of had what I call the, the street cred, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you worked for you worked for Chris Reed Knives, and so it gave us the credibility that oh yeah, we do know how to make stuff and. Then once we kind of proved ourselves, like, yeah, we, we got the setup, we got the equipment, we can do it, you know, it just grew from there. So, yeah. Well, that's, that's actually great because, uh, yeah, I mean, Chris Reeve knives, everyone knows them and everyone, uh, ad admires and respects their work, but also there's a, a little mystique around it. Uh, um, you know, uh, it seems to be a very, uh, uh, he seemed to be a very exacting guy just from the interviews I'd seen. And that's a great way to learn anything, you know, right. um, you know, if you can work, if you can pass muster in a place like that, well, man, your place must be amazing, you know? So, yeah, um, sure. okay. So, okay. So that's why uh, you make the clip uh, for, you make aftermarket Sabenza clips, right? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, as you're, you're making these knives for years, you know, and you always have your kind of your own personal ideas. And, you know, I guess we could never convince uh, them to do that and pursue that. And so that was kind of one thing that we thought, well, you know, this would be really cool if we could do this. And so once we were doing our own thing, uh, you know, you're, you're always doing market research, looking, looking for openings. And we thought, well, heck, you know, what, what high quality knife is out there that has as long of a life as, as the CRK line and would be able to support the cost of such a beautifully machined and made uh, accessory essentially and there's enough out there because they've been making them for what 30 years now right. and they all use the exact same clip and so it was like well what a great opportunity it was something that we would have always liked to have seen and you know we we designed it and modeled it so it fit the aesthetics of the factory knife. So if you looked at it, you wouldn't necessarily think, oh, this was made by another company. This looks like a factory option to this to this knife. And, and that was our goal was to not overwhelm it, but to complement an already really nice product, you know, that we ourselves had hand in for many, many years. Sure. Um, so yeah, and the demand has just been crazy. In fact, I've been behind for the last couple of months here and I'm just, fielding constant emails. Hey, when are you going to release more? When are you going to release more? It's like, it's coming, it's coming, I promise. <laughs> so so those who, who aren't watching or who aren't familiar with the with the clip itself, it's a milled titanium clip that fits the Sebenza, right? Yep. And and it, uh, yeah, it really, it, it looks very different from the factory clip. But right. like you said, it really complements the design. Does that fit on other, um, like the Umnum Zahn or the other Chris Reeve knives? Yeah, so the only knife it does not fit on is the Umnundi. Okay. And uh, the Umnundi has its own uh, solid CNC machined titanium clip for it. Right. And that's kind of where the idea originally came from. It's like, well, heck, they offer this beautifully custom made clip for the Umnundi. Why aren't they offering it for the Sabenzas? They decided to go with the, the, the stamped bent clip. Uh, you know, that's just a sheet of titanium. Um, and so it was like, well, there, you know, there's an option there. Guys want that. They'll, you know, they'll they'll pay for the the accessory of the knife. And, you know, you have such a nice product that you want to showcase it on the outside of your pocket as well, you know. And so, yeah. you know, we got more and more ideas and, and new materials came available. You know, we got the Timascus and the black Timascus. And then, you know, based on what they had done on the past with inlays, we tried to match some of the inlays. So those that had spent the money on mammoth ivory, you know, mm -hmm. they could get a matching uh, a mammoth ivory inlay clip or carbon fiber or micarta or any, you know, several of the exotic woods. And, you know, some we haven't, we haven't done just because there hasn't been a lot of demand for it, but uh, there's a lot of options available. Uh, one of the popular ones right now are the, uh, the Wilson combat pattern ones. Oh yeah. With so, the radiating 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We call it the custom machine pattern, but it's it's the Wilson Combat Array that they that they use. Array. Uh, so before we got off on uh, on the uh, Chris Reeve knives um, uh, side topic, we were talking about. Uh, whether you have always been a knife guy and, and your father, you know, yeah. growing up in Idaho, I would imagine it comes oh, up. Oh, yeah. I mean, for sure, outdoors, guys, you know, we, we've hunted, we've fished, you know. Um, fortunately, having uh, been exposed to knives and good quality knives, you know, you always develop that little bit of of snob snobbery, I guess you'd call it, you know, like, oh, I need a good knife. That's, that's you know, the that, right term. That's unacceptable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and our buddies would come and pull their whatever out that they bought at the you know the the local store you know and it's like eh, what kind of steel you got on that yeah. oh you don't know <laughs> <laughs> uh, here let's use this one you know and uh we know exactly what it is and we can get it sharpened and so yeah i mean you could definitely say we've always been knife guys but i think as well we've always been the guys that, that we like to make our own stuff you know we like to Right. Um, play around with engineering and designing and, and, and making it and, and knives is always a good niche. And the cool thing that, uh, you know, my dad has always said about the knives is as opposed to like general contract manufacturing, a knife, you get to see the very beginning to the very end. And so you really get to enjoy the finished product, you know, and you get to have pride in that rather than making some abstract part for some engineering company that's going to go to some big company and, and it's going to be a tiny little component and a tiny inside of a big machine you know you just never know right. but the knives and the cool thing about the knives too is it expands beyond just the cnc machining uh you've got the finishing um the design work and so you know that's not typical in a machine shop and so it really allows us to kind of expand and enjoy a lot of facets of uh, of the manufacturing. So uh, Jim is rolling through your Instagram page here, and and I see two things. Um, uh, one, the torrent, uh, and that's the, the this is a Schwartz design, right? Yes. Yes. That, so that is a knife that came out uh, pretty much under your shingle right i mean that is the millet torrent it's not someone right. else's knife right and so right now we're running two licensed designs uh, under the the schwartz designs as a millet knife and that's actually kind of the direction we've been moving here within the last year or so we've been trying to minimize the contract work and transition into our own our own millet line mm -hmm. um and so the torrent is one of them that we've we've really started focusing on uh you know it's, we're going to start offering that more regularly and in three different configurations, there'll be, um, and actually I have some here to display. Oh yeah. I have uh, what we call the light, which is the traditional um, put, flat put handle. Up, put that up closer to the camera, please. Yeah. There you go. With Thank anodized you. backspacer and clip, uh, we still run a hardened steel insert, uh, roller uh, bearings. Ooh. And what we did on this is we pocketed out the inside and so it's just, it's really, really light. Um, and that's why we call it the light, uh, because it's just, it's just super light. It's smooth as you'd expect. And then from this one, we will offer the inlaid version, which we've offered in the past as a custom. Mm. And so you can see this one is uh, one of the carbon fiber options. And because it's pocketed out for the inlay, it's not lightened on the inside, but you still have a relatively similar weight due to the uh, the pocket for the for the carbon fiber. Right, and that carbon fiber is so light, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the third option is the original one uh, that TJ designed, and that was with the skeletonizing, which that's... you saw on the Instagram feed there. Yeah. And so this one's kind of interesting because it's asymmetric. As you can see, the the face is thicker than the back, and that was by design by TJ. And so we skeletonized the overlay here, and uh, it is you can see it's screwed on on the surface rather than inlaid, and that's why we call it the overlay rather than inlay. Mm -hmm. and, and to match the titanium in the back, uh, we've got some skeletonizing in the titanium handle. Let's see if I get my camera to focus there, but. So you mentioned, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, yeah, no Josiah, but you, you mentioned roller bearings. Mm -hmm. That that differs from ball bearings somehow, No, it's right? the same thing. Oh, it's same a, thing, okay. Yeah, the hardened steel 
ball bearings. Ball bearings. Okay. Yeah, uh, what's the right. what are the what's the uh, blade length on that? So it's just over three inches. Okay. Uh, I'd have to look up my specs. I I deal with so many knives, I forget exactly what this one is. Yeah, uh, I, I've never had one in hand, so I was just I was just curious about that. Yeah. Uh, Being a shop here, I can measure for you real quick. <laughs> So we're about 3.175 inches. Okay, so, so about, yeah, about three inches and three sixteenths. So you mentioned um, a, another knife, uh, and and we saw I think it's the same one at the Hoplite. Is that what it's called, Hoplite? No, the Hoplite's an old uh, an old one we had done um, oh, okay. for Jeff Simmons. Oh. Uh, Aegis Knife Works. Okay. And I don't think he's currently making knives right now. Um, but the second one we we're we're offering is the Overland. Over. Oh God, I love this knife. So and, this, let let me just interject here. This this was uh, 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 this is a TJ Schwartz design right. that I I absolutely love. And 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 for a while I guess uh, CRKT was making it, but I when I, I spoke with him on the show here and I, I uh, kind of gushed about this design because I, I absolutely love it. But, you know, I, I was thinking it kind of needed a, a, a uh, uh, I, I was just basically saying, boy, I can't wait till you make customs or whatever of that. And right. really, really what I was getting at is that I love CRKT for what they do and everything, but I'm just not, you know, I, I don't like, you know, I don't want to see RKT right now. Right. Right. I, so this this one is going to be available very soon. Uh, I did the the pre production launch, which was a very very limited quantity. I only did about thirty, um, and we had we had done a couple of things that I was I was hoping to get some feedback. And the customers have been really good about giving me some feedback on, on some of those things I was worried about, and um, they've all been very positive. So I think we've got a winner, and uh, yeah, this is going to be a regular production for us and be available. Uh, we're going to be retailing them for about two forty five. And That's yeah, a fair it's, price. It's, that is a, a super cool knife. It's so it's so thin. Um, you just don't realize how thin and how lightweight this is until you get it in your hand. So for an EDC carry, it's awesome. Um, in fact, I just I threw some calipers on and measured it. It's three eighths of, of an inch thick if you don't count the pocket clip. You know, this this is a cool knife, too, because uh, it is an excellent EDC design but also it's a very unique design. So you can have yes. the best of both worlds. You can have something that's imminently usable, but also just unique. And, uh, but that unique look is for a purpose. I mean, when you cut with this knife, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm assuming it's, you know, the same yeah. as the CRKT I experienced. When you cut with this knife, your knuckles are out of the way. It puts your hand in the perfect position and you just look cool doing it. It's, it's just such a, uh, I'm very happy to hear that this is going to be a regular production of yours. What were the things that you were asking for feedback on? Uh, so one of my concerns was we actually ran a, a pretty thick clip. Um, generally, you run about a 40,000 thick titanium clip, and we ran a 50,000 thick clip. And the reason we did that was because, because it is so light and so thin that I wanted a knife that guys could carry in their shorts. And so I, I wanted to make sure that when guys put this in their pocket, it stayed because I think we can all attest that nothing's more frustrating than having, uh, you know, one of your favorite knives in your pocket and the thing falls out mm -hmm. and you just don't know what happened. Did it snag something? Did it slide out? You know, whatever it may be. But, you know, I've been there, you know, lost four or $500 custom knives and, and who knows where it went, you know? And so, we really wanted a strong clip so that baby would hang on to your shorts and or whatever slacks or pants you were wearing and and not have an issue with it falling out um yeah and then that was really the big one uh, realistically was the clip and then just some just some fine tuning to make sure that everything felt good in the hand everything was flowing smooth um but yeah it, it turned out to be a huge success it, it's awesome and uh, we're pretty excited to really get this baby moving and, and get it out there for you guys. Is that on uh, bronze washers? It is. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things that TJ really wanted was to get away from something that could get dirty and get mucked up and you have to disassemble yeah. and clean it. And so just real simple phosphorus bronze washers. 
Uh, we put a little bit of uh, a little bit of oil in it just to keep it lubricated and keep it smooth. But yeah, it's it's the thing just flows. I mean, you don't even need to have it a flipper and it just deploys like magic, you know, and there's there's no play either direction. You got your titanium back. Um, you were running it in S35 VN steel. So, you know, you're going to get a really good steel. Um, we do offer it in a, in a Cerakoted version or a stone washed. So, you know, whatever, whatever type of finish you like, uh, we can make that available. And then we offer it in a, on a black and a tan base with either a black or orange accents, which, uh, is a little bit different coloring than CRKT was offering on theirs. And that's kind of what we were shooting for. We wanted guys to know that, you know, even just at a glance with color, this is the higher quality one with the better, better materials, a uh, little tighter tolerancing. Um, and then our, we also run, ran the clip much higher than the CRKT did. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get more of a deep carry. Um, but yeah, so. And when can we expect this to hit the market? You mentioned it. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> no pressure. No, that's, that's totally fine. Um, I'm hoping to have these done. I was hoping by the end of this month, it looks like I'm going to run into a next month a little bit before they're, they're fully ready and available. Um, you know, I've got some previous obligations and contracts we're trying to get finished up with guys and, uh, but yeah, you know, and uh, we got some other cool stuff with some uh, some of these young makers, like you talked about. And so we're trying to kind of figure out how to work it all into the the schedule and and make it work for everybody. So. Yeah. So you mentioned that your um, operation is smaller than people might expect. Um, if you could uh, give us an idea of of what your shop is like, um, you know, in whatever you want to divulge. Yeah, so right now we've got about six guys working. Uh, we're in about 3,500 square feet. Uh, we've got uh, four milling machines, two surface grinders, water jet, uh, two belt grinders, and, uh, you know, our tumbling machine. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, and I think a lot of people expect us to be a lot bigger for the diversity of things that we're able to put out yeah. and some of the, you know, some of the things we do, you know. We've even got a, you know, we've got a kitchen knife we've been working on, which has been pretty fun. Do you have that there? Yeah. So this is from uh, a customer called Adam Simha MKS knives. So it's a, it's an eight inch chef's knife here. G10 handle, stone wash finish, razor, razor thin. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I took one out testing the other day and, you know, I was able to slice through a full-size watermelon, no problem. Just, oh, man. just like butter. Yeah, well, so, you know, your description of the shop is a lot smaller than I expected. Even when you see uh, pictures from your Instagram, uh, not that I'm trying to snoop around your shop, but you'll you'll see, like, you'll see parts laid out. And, and to me, that, you know, uh, the impression that leaves me is that uh, there's, it's bigger. Right. And, and that's pretty amazing that you're able to, um, yeah, like, uh, pump, I don't want to say pump out, but, uh, that you're able to produce the diversity of work that you are and right. not, not just in uh, the different makers and such, but there, I mean, you look at that kitchen knife, it is beautiful and it's simple and it looks perfect. And then you look at the, um, the overlaid version of the torrent and it is beautiful and complicated. And, and the right. fact that those come out of the same shop, um, probably not at the same time. I'm not sure how that works, but. I mean, that's pretty yeah, I mean, it, it definitely varies. You know, we, we try and schedule and, you know, in order to make some money, you know, cause you got to stay operational. We, we try and stagger everything depending on the needs of each product and try and keep the, the machines busy and the guys busy at each, at each stage of operation. And, uh, sometimes, you know, they're, they're at the same time. Sometimes they're staggered. Sometimes we have to focus on just one product all the way through and then move on to the next one. Um, you know, but then there's, there's delays too. You know, we got things that are out being coated or we have things mm -hmm. while they're out being, um, heat treated because we don't do the heat treating in house. Um, and so that gives us opportunity to work on something else while we're waiting for that stuff to come back. And so, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a juggling game, you know, trying to get things scheduled and, and keep things flowing well and keeping things coming in and going out the door. So. Yeah. Uh, how do you how do you hope to see millet grow? I mean, do you want it to become a bigger operation, or or do you like the intimate size of it now? How does that, how's that? Uh... Well, if you if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, you know, I wanted to see just a, a giant manufacturing facility and just making stuff. But 
you know, over the last, I don't know, probably year, year, year or two, um, I, I kind of like the idea that we're, we're a little smaller, you know, we can control things, I can stay involved. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll see where things go. Uh, our big push right now is to be able to move more towards the, the millet line of stuff. And so we've started doing some more collaboration type contracts and jobs with guys. Uh, you know, you brought up Newfoundland, which is a perfect example. You know, we've been working with Jonathan Styles, and so far we got about three or four brand new designs that we're going to run under the Millet brand and the Jonathan Styles designs, uh, who is the owner of Newfoundland Knives. And we're really excited. We've got some really cool ideas, and, you know, we'll be messaging each other back and forth with new, you know, creative ideas and options. And, and so that's been really fun. You know, and, and you're right, he is a he is a new maker. Uh, he's up in Canada, which is pretty cool. Um, but he's he's excited. He's got a lot of new ideas. So we're really excited to work with them. And, you know, and then, uh, you know, we have a couple other guys that are we're doing stuff for, uh, you know, we got a, a company, a brand new company that's on Kickstarter right now. You probably jump over and check those guys out. It's uh, they're called Reef Knives. Uh, they're doing some really cool uh, outdoor knives, kind of a, lo a little bit different than the Newfoundland style knives, which again kind of adds to that diversity of, of what we're able to do. Um, you know, the Newfoundlands focus on real, real thin slicing, uh, multi-purpose knives, and uh, the reef knives they're they're a little heavier duty, they're a little more robust. Um, you know, you ask a guy what what the the most important part of a knife is, and everybody's going to give you a different answer, right? Yeah, yeah. And it, it all depends on what you like, what you're going to do with it, what your expectations are. And so it's it's pretty cool to be able to offer a whole bunch of different options and, and play with different ideas. And yeah. I got to say, that was one of the things um, when when we were, you know, this, this knife has been with me for about a month or so. It's been on a number of shows. One of the shows we do is a live stream. And uh, we were talking about this knife and a lot of the viewers really loved that this is so thin and slicey and right. uh, but but still it's an outdoor knife and i've used it for light outdoor stuff and uh you know people so, some pretty wise commenters were saying you know steel is a pretty uh pretty robust and tough material to begin with and uh you know it takes a bit to break a knife so it depends you know if you're being a jackass with your knife oh, <laughs> i shouldn't put it that way i shouldn't put it that way but but, but they were basically saying that knife that thin knife is going to do you well because you're going to be able to cut and slice anything right but but no doubt you know in a pinch you could pound this through a piece of wood and it would come out just fine it's yeah. still you I know? think I think you're totally right, you know, and I'm I'm along a very similar opinion. Is you get the guys out there that are just destructives, you know, that they just want to hack and chop through anything, whether it's a a tire, or a two by four, and it's like, man, <laughs> it's a knife. Why, yeah. why are you doing that to your knife? Like, go use it as a knife. You know, if you got to use it for survival scenarios, you know, I understand you 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 do what you got to do, but when you're out there just chopping and hacking, you know, it's like. I, I, I don't know if I can go along with that per se, but you know, if you think about like machetes, machetes are really thin. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and guys are swinging them things around and chopping anything they can think of. And, and like you said, they're, they're very robust and they withstand a lot of abuse. And so if you, if you do it right, I think you can make a very thin quality knife that's just as effective. And in fact, one of the knives that we're, we're talking to um, Newfoundland with is, is a, is a much larger, thin knife like that. And so we're, we're pretty excited about that. So why, uh, why do you think there aren't more millet style companies in the United States? You know, there's a, there's an inside joke that we like to joke around where we'll, we'll take parts and we'll kind of throw them in a machine and we'll push a bu couple of buttons like a microwave and then we'll wait for about five seconds and then we'll hear a beep. And you know, you open the door and you pull it out and there's a completed product. <laughs> but that's not really that how it works, right? And I think there's there's a certain perspective that when knives are ordered to be made overseas, they there's there's no visibility in the amount of effort and labor that goes into that to make that happen. And so as an American manufacturer, you know, it's, it's very challenging with 
you know, U.S. labor and our small business limitations to be able to manufacture as fast as we can, as affordable as we can. And, you know, often we're, cha- we're competing with these overseas manufacturers that have huge exchange rates, you know, and, and where labor is one of their most valuable resources and low cost, it's one of our greatest. And that, that definitely brings a huge challenge. And as a manufacturer, you know, we're, we're the bottom of the totem pole because we're essentially a wholesaler going to either a maker who then can either sell directly or they go to a dealer and then the dealer sells to the end user. And so you have several layers in there of distribution that you're trying, everyone's trying to carve out a living, you know, and make a profit. And so it it becomes quite challenging. And I think that's why you see a lot of American manufacturers, they make it when they run their own brand, because now they can either distribute direct or they go right to a dealer. And then the dealer makes the sales to, to the end user. So you only got one person in between the manufacturer and the end user. Uh, which opens up those margins quite tremendously. And you even find nowadays that the bulk of manufacturers will sell directly uh, mm-hmm. just so they can maintain those margins and, and do that. And, you know, and that's, that's definitely one of the directions we're heading. And one of the reasons we're heading to, you know, roll out our millet line of knives is so that can help sustain us. And then with our excess capacity, that's when we'll, you know, we'll bring in select contract work of, you know, small companies or whoever that we can help that we think is going to be uh, beneficial uh, business wise. Um, and then obviously stuff we're interested in because, you mm-hmm. know, there's always the fun side of it. Right. Um, so, yeah. So I, I think that's kind of why it makes it difficult to be an American manufacturer. And, and, you know, when, when these retailers or these companies are sending stuff overseas, like I said, they can, they give it to these companies and they have engineers and designers and, and all these machinists and, and this full crew that they can sit down, they can dial it in, they can run prototypes, they can run samples. Um, you know, they probably have entire departments established to be able to do that where we just don't have that flexibility. You know, we don't necessarily have that time to do the engineering and all of that unless we're compensated to do so. Right. And as a, as a, a job shop manufacturer, if a company approached us and said, Hey, we want to make this. And I said, okay, well, do you have your, your geometric dimensioning, tolerancing prints, all designed, planned, ready to go, that we can plug it into the, the CAM system, extract our geometry and, you know, program it right for the machine. If they said no, I'd say, well, then you can hire an engineer to do it or you can pay us for our time to do it. And so it gets pretty tough for knife designers, especially uh, startup guys and new companies to, to approach us and say, hey, how do I do this? And I say, well, do you have prototypes? Do you have CAD drawings? Do you have any of that? And, yeah. and probably 90% of them say no. And that's when we'll redirect them to a designer or we'll say, Hey, you know, we can help you out with this, but you know, here's our hourly rate. This is what it costs for us to put in the time and labor to do that. And the hard part is anytime you make something, you always have to do, you always have to design and build the tooling to do that, you know, and, as simple as a fixed blade is, you still have handles, you still have the tang that has to be machined and it has to be ground, bevel ground. And so right out of the gate, you've got three fixtures that have to be designed and made to fit that knife. And so that's one of our requirements for a new customer coming in is, hey, uh, if, if you're at the point where you have CAD models that we can extract geometry from, that we can develop some blueprints for. Uh, we have some upfront costs to get tooled up and geared up because we're going to have time designing and making the tooling, the what we call our fixtures, just to be able to get to make those parts. And then if you have somebody that doesn't really know, they just want to make a prototype and see how it works. It's like, you know, just one prototype. Oh, you're going to have to pay all that upfront cost to test it just to and see if it works. Exactly. And so it could be t- tough because if something you invest all that cost and then something's not right and we got to go back and redo it, it can get expensive. So, uh, you know, we've been able to overcome a lot of that nowadays with plastic prints. And so a lot of guys are going to 3d printers and after we get everything modeled and, and get them helped out doing that, they'll print it, you know, they'll put it in their hand, make sure there's no hot spots, make sure it's comfortable, 
Um, you know, it's a little tricky to find your balance points, but I think uh, looking at the ratio wise using materials, you can get pretty close. And a lot of the CAD softwares nowadays will calculate that for you. You mean the actual uh, weight balance because exactly. you're using a lighter material with the 3D exactly. printing? Exactly. Yeah. Where's where's the center of balance on like on a fixed plate? You know, is it is it a little tang heavy? Is it a little handle heavy? Where where does that balance fall in? And so uh, a lot of customers are able to um, kind of skip ahead a lot of that that expensive manufacturing costs, and then they come to us and be like, okay, I'm confident this is what I want because I printed it, I've tested it, I felt it. And then after that, any minor little tweaks isn't going to affect the fixturing or tooling at all. It's just a matter of adjusting the program um, or tweaking it a little bit and we're, we're off and running. But, um, you know, and then obviously folders are much more complex. Oh, yeah. You know, you got, you got your pivots, you got your backspacers, um, you know, depending on your blades, you got your lock inserts. If you're running lock inserts, you know, if you're running inlays, overlays, you've got your handles or are you running liners? You know, and so every component needs its own little way to hold it so you can machine it. You know, you got to be able to machine all the way around it. And so there's different techniques on how to hold it and so on and so forth. And that's what the fixture is. It's the thing, it's the tool you create to be able to hold the material to actually mill out. Exactly. Okay, so I didn't know any of that when I sent you a, uh, a design on a, on a cocktail napkin 10 years ago or no, it was right. like six years ago. Hey, I want to make this. You're like, okay, <laughs> right. this is what it's going to take. I was like, ooh. Okay, I'll get yeah. back to you never. <laughs> right, and, and and that's what happens, you know, and, and we try to do the best we can to facilitate that, you know, and but sometimes it gets tough, you know, because you got a lot of guys that, yeah. that want to move up into making knives, but there's just that entry level barrier to get through that and it's, it's tough. Yeah, well, I mean, if you don't know, you don't know. And then when you find out, you're like, okay, now I know what I don't know and it's time to do my own research before I right. take this step. Uh, you, you do other, on, on your website, it says you, you will kind of do any portion of the process mm -hmm. soup to nuts individually. I, you know, you have a full suite of services if, you, if you're gonna have a whole knife made uh, like this one here, but you also will kind of do any part of that process. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And actually that's, uh, uh, that's kind of what I've been moving to as, as we've been transitioning into, like I said, the, the mill at line. Uh, any outside work that I bring in is just uh, parts and components, you know, for example, yeah. Uh, we've been helping out uh, G&G Hawk with some of their projects and he'll just have us water jet and surface grind. And that's all he needs for right now. And so, you know, we're happy to oblige and help him out and it, it works out pretty well. But it's nice because it comes in, we do that operation and it's out the door and then, you know, we don't have to worry about it. You know, we don't have to worry about trying to, to fit the knife and assemble it and all the headaches that come with that. And, you know, oh, is something wrong here? Is something wrong there? And so we just kind of let those guys handle it and it's their project. So, <laughs> well, it's, it seems great for both sides, right? You know, you can, Absolutely. you can kind of, it's like kind of quick work for you in a way. And for the makers of who are making mid tech knives or whatever, you know, they're, they're getting some of the stuff made out, out of house. I mean, you know, not, not only is it great to know it's going to be great quality coming from you guys, but also they have the bragging rights and, and, you know, that's right. frankly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, it's, it, it gets tricky too, because you get, you, you know, you get customers that they only want a specific operation, um, you know, and, and like any other company, we bid the work uh, at a certain level or a certain quality, you know, and if that's what they want, we try to deliver exactly how they want it at the price point that they need it to come in to make it worthwhile to them. And so uh, I feel sometimes it, it's a little frustrating because as a manufacturer, we kind of get jumped on for decisions that we really didn't have a whole lot of say in right it's kind of like well you know we just fulfilled what the customer wanted and unfortunately we really didn't have a lot of say or you know contribution to that other than just doing what the customer wanted and if our name happens to get attached to it we kind of get thrown under the bus but right it, it's the nature of the game i guess and and that's fine but we, we just do the best we can and keep trudging ahead well, okay. So in closing, Josiah, if you had, um, you know, just looking ahead to the millet line of knives mm -hmm. at this stage in your life right now with how you feel about knives, you know, so far, what would your ideal knife be that uh, millet would make? What would it look like? 
You got you got to you got to narrow the parameters a little bit. Are we okay? Talking? Okay, it's a, it's a okay. All right, all right, okay, all right. It's a, it's a it's a folder, okay. and it's and it's uh and it's um within reach, kind of like the Overland um, or or the uh, Perpetua, something that or I'm sorry, the um, the Torrent, so, Torrent Light, something that uh, yeah. the Hoi Polloi could afford, uh, you know. So I I really like that uh, that. 350 to 450 price point knives. Um, it allows us to really put a lot more value into the knives. Uh, you know, we can start putting uh, ceramic ball bearings in, uh, hardened steel lock inserts, everything's tie. We can do nicer finishes on. Um, you know, we actually made a knife years ago that is actually the one I carry around the most. And it's, it's simple, it's clean, um, it's a it's a bead blasted all tie finish with the Damascus backspacer DLC coated blade. It's uh, just over a, about a three and a half inch blade. Um, it's contoured handles, so it's got a nice rounded handle, and it's got a deep carry pocket clip. Um, so that's it's it's a little bit it's a little bit longer and thinner rather than a, a wider knife, mm -hmm. you know, like the like the deep blade knives. Uh, we've done plenty of those before. But uh, yeah, it's just kind of a happy medium. Everything. It's not too small. It's not one of the big guys. Uh, it's got a little bit of a, some embellishments on it, so you got a little bit of bragging rights. Like, oh yeah, you know, I got some, you know, stainless Damascus in the back. Um, you know, I got the the DLC coating on the blade, even though it is stainless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so you got some, and uh, I really like the silver black contrast. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the carbon uh, carbon fibers for that reason. You know, the marbled carbon fibers, things like that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my that's kind of my ideal parameters for a knife. And um, as far as like a blade tip, you know, not, I love a traditional knife, but on a certain knife, depending on how it looks, there's nothing like a Tanto tip either. And I'm you know, I was converted several years ago to that. I used to think, man, Tanto, what a waste! You know, that's so dumb. But we made a Tanto, and I'm trying to think of whose it was. And I just fell in love with it. I was like, man, this thing is so sweet. Having that secondary edge like that, but still yeah. having a tip, like, you know, it's just it's just ergonomic the way you can hold your hand and use the end for if you're, you know, if you're cutting on the, the long part of the blade, it's just super uh, efficient and effective. And so, um, yeah, you know, something about Tano's that are pretty sweet too. Oh, yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. But then if you had said a Bowie, I said, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more too because I just right. love it all. <laughs> Yeah, that and that's hard. That's like, what's your favorite meal? It's like, man, I, I like so much. It's like, it's hard to narrow it down to one. But yeah. Well, until we see that ideal knife, we'll be able to get the Overland. That'll be coming out soon, and uh, the Torrent. And uh, we'll keep our eyes out for all the other Millet line knives, and yeah. uh, and also know that the other knives that come out from your shop are just amazing also so uh, well, i can't you. go yeah uh, i mean from from what i've seen and from what i've heard uh, i know that that's the case so for sure uh, yeah well thank you so much josiah it's been a pleasure talking with you yeah thank you for having me we'll uh, see you around all right take care sir will do do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR, 13MOV, and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie, probably worse. There he goes, Josiah DeMille of Millet Knives. What a cool outfit. Uh, like I said before, I hope... Uh, I think we all hope that some people use them as a model and maybe we see more uh, U.S. OEMs of, of super high quality like Millet Knives. Uh, if you like these kind of interviews and you want to hear more interviews with people who make the knife world happen, check in with us every Sunday for a new interview here on the Knife Junkie podcast. Also, check us out on Wednesdays for the midweek supplemental where I perseverate on knives that I love and show off knives that I've gotten. Another $5 words like perseverate. And uh, of course, Thursday Night Knives, my probably uh, my my favorite time of the week because it's where we get to hang out here live here on Twitch and on Facebook live and uh, and talk knives with you guys and gals you all just uh, can can join with uh, the knifejunkie.com slash join so until next week I'm Bob DeMarco saying don't take dull for an answer Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.